Morning, Liz. Morning, Jeff. How are you? All right. I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Exciting day today. Congrats. Three day with <laughs> <laughs> How cool. Awesome. What's it feel like to have a big round announced and, you know, you've been working your butt off to build this company and now a whole bunch of people are, you know, more aware of you and what you're doing. What's it? I don't know. It feels really good. I think yeah. it's one of those. It's one of those things where it's um, it's really hard to take a like just to slow down and just appreciate what you're building and like the fun of it all. And days like today force you to do that. Um, yeah. so it's so easy to just say like laser focus. So like that feels good. And then the other funny thing is the amount of investor inbounds when I'm like, wait, today is like definitely. <laughs> <laughs> where were you a month ago? Right, I know. <laughs> Uh, no, I think you're actually your point. I want to come back to that because your point about celebrating milestones, I think is a huge thing for entrepreneurs. And, you know, I know having started two companies, if you're really driven, you're just constantly climbing the mountain and it's good every once in a while for people to sort of say like, Hey, you're, you're, you know, you're accomplishing some amazing things. So kudos to you. And that is certainly, you know, coming from me, I would say you're accomplishing amazing things, but talk, talk a little bit about, um, you know, you kind of came up with this idea uh, a little over a year ago. Yep. And you and I met when you were kind of in the early days of forming the idea way before you raised the seed round, but talk about sort of how you got the, you know, not, well, not only where the idea came from, but where you got the gumption to say, I need to go do this. Cause I think that's always something that entrepreneurs, potential entrepreneurs will email me about thinking about this idea and, but they don't, they don't often get over the hump. What, what got you over the hump and said, I gotta go do this. Totally. I mean, just for a little bit of background. So I've always loved real estate. Um, I have been, you know, a real estate fan since I was pretty young. Like I was, I joke like the kid that would get all the real estate magazines at the supermarket. I'm still that person. I like to go to a grocery store for that reason. So I've always been fascinated by real estate. And then when I went into my professional career, I entered uh, the financial data space. I worked at Bloomberg and I was a mortgage specialist there really just by chance. So I kind of kept finding my way back into real estate no matter what. And, and while I you know, started working on real estate in my professional life, I was just amazed by how much innovation there needed to be in the space. So like, I'm, you know, 21 years old, a salesperson at Bloomberg covering these major accounts in the Midwest, like Allstate was paying us, you know, tens of millions of dollars a year. And they were asking me for information about individual properties and we didn't have it. And I'm like, wait, what? Like Bloomberg, and, and this is, you know, 10 plus years ago, like you had a Bloomberg, that's how you got your info. So, you know, even 10 years ago, I was like, all right, there's something here where we have this multi-trillion dollar asset class, but there's still not a bunch of information, but I just personally was not prepared to run a business, but I knew I wanted to eventually. So I ended up going into the startup space. I joined a seven person restaurant tech company uh, and spent several years there scaling out their sales and marketing team and like sharpened, I think my skill set on how to operate early stage businesses. And I think that was a key moment for me because I always had the passion in real estate but I didn't have the tools to run a, run a business. Mm -hmm. So to me, I was like, okay, cool. I'm feeling like I have an increasing amount of conviction and like I have the skills to start something, but I wanted to get deeper into the real estate data problem specifically. So I joined a series B backed, you know, real estate, commercial real estate tech company in New York called Reonomy. And I was responsible for growth there, revenue and data acquisition. And that's when I was able to like really get into the weeds and say like, okay, cool. Like where are the actual pockets of opportunity here? Like I was broadly interested in the space, but like, what does that mean from like what I want to build? And I recommend that to anyone that has a space they like or an idea is like join several different companies. So you can mm -hmm. narrow it on the specific problem you want to solve and develop that toolkit. So you're actually prepared to run a business. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, you love the space. Yeah. You work for a couple of companies in this area. Yep. And, you know, then you, you come up with this and, and is everything today gone according to plan? <laughs> Nothing's gone according to plan. Um, it never does. So the first, the, 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 really the first idea for Realm was that I was obsessed with that American for the average American homeowner, their house is their biggest asset. So that's consistent. Yeah. That's stayed the same. Our obsession with that has never changed, but the way that we interpret that obsession and want to help people tap into the value has definitely changed and not gone as bad. So when we first started realm, I was like, okay, you know, I want to help people get more value out of their property. Like maybe I should build a vertical construction business. which like, I had no business doing, I don't know anything about construction. I've never built anything. Um, and what, what was interesting, so I started to explore that path. I'm like, okay, what would yeah. that look like? I'm going to piece together lending and all of these things. I'm like, and the net of that is I will help people get more value out of their property, which is the same value prop that Rome has. It's just a totally different interpretation right. of that value prop. And when I was working on like, you know, just working on that very early, like research and talking to, talking to users, 
I kept going back to the thing that actually unlocked value in that process was the data I was providing them. So I found myself, even as I explored other paths to helping people unlock value from their property, it all brought me back to data and insights are the key to that. So I would say like, definitely didn't go as planned, thought about a bunch of different ways to do that, but I've never lost my conviction in this overall vision of like, it's crazy that people can't understand and get value out of their property. Yeah. And I think that's true of every company, right? Every company goes through a journey and people like to call it a pivot, but you know, the reality is there, there are some big pivots, but most companies go through these kind of constant iterations. So you, you start to build the company, you bring on the initial team, you raise the seed round with, uh, with Lehrer and primary two of the yeah. best angel investors or seed investors in, in New York. Yeah. And talk a little about the company building process. Where did you go recruit from? How did you convince people to come join you early? Cause that's always, you know, when it's sort of your idea, uh, and not much else. It's hard to it's hard to attract great people, but you've attracted an amazing team. Can you talk a little about how you did that? Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm very lucky. So I think first thing I did was I had angels involved at the table early on that worked at companies that I wanted to recruit people from. And I wish I could say that this was like done on purpose, um, but now in hindsight, I would definitely do this on purpose in the future. So like I knew that hey, we were going to build this business that had a lot of moving pieces, a lot of data, some operational complexity. So I have angel investors from a lot of the businesses that have scaled quickly over the last 10 years, like the Ubers of the world, mm-hmm. um, that invested 20, 25 grand in our, in our angel round. And they have been an amazing source of recruiting because they have these deep networks, Slack channels, email lists, friends that they met building and scaling those companies. Yeah. So I can turn to them and say like, hey, I need someone that's good at a lot of things. And I don't know exactly how their role is going to evolve over the next 12 months. And what's so useful about the connections there is like, you're not really hiring for a role, you're hiring for a type of person and and like an appetite. And if you've worked with someone before, you can make that match really quickly. So Rohan, who, you know, is our uh, VP of data and, you know, was my second hire here. I met him through an angel investor Mm -hmm. and I wasn't sure what he was going to do. I was like, this guy just seems really good, really creative. He was a, a, a scooter, market, you know, a, a scooter launcher at Uber previously, a market launcher. And I was like, and I think we'll figure this stuff out together. And his role ended up evolving in a million different ways, but like I would never change that higher for the world. So I think from a team building side, I would say like get angel investors that you want to leverage their Rolodex. And then two is use your early investors. So primary um, recruited Libby, our VP of marketing. They introduced me to her. Uh, so they not only did they introduce us, but they also helped with the recruiting process. Like, you know, for someone like Libby, she com- came from consulting and big brand names. Like they needed to convince her that it was worth taking a risk on this little startup that's, you know, eight people. So I think leveraging your seed investors can be really helpful, not only for the sourcing, but for the convincing at the end. And also, it sounds like you have been very willing to hire just great people and kind of let them figure it out. I think that's also one of the magical things about early stage companies is you find these people, you're not necessarily, you're kind of hiring them for a functional role, but they come in and just take on a whole bunch of other stuff and bring creativity and ideas. And I don't know, I think that's one of the fun parts about bringing in those first few hires. For sure. And if you, I think if if you hire someone and their job ends up being exactly what the JD that you wrote is, the company's not moving fast enough. Mm. I love that. I love that. That's a great way to put it. Even even in growth stage, right? I mean, we, yeah, we for sure. People bring in these amazing people from these larger companies, and they come in and expand the role, create new ideas, new opportunities. What? Um, and so then, talk a little about. I, I want to. I love the founder journey. I could spend hours talking about that because I think so many people learn from people like you who started these companies and then raised capital. Yeah. Talk a little about the market and sort of why. You know, there we have Zillow and Open Door and Redfin and other companies that are out there that have, I mean, Zillow is now a, I don't know, $25, $30 billion company. Open Door, I think, is 10. A lot of value created in this space, but it's still so early in terms of technology, you know, the way people manage their homes. Talk a little about why that is and where you see the big opportunities and, and how you guys plan to go after it. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things that have caused real estate innovation to lag behind other financial asset classes. So I think the first thing is that the way that people view uh, real estate is changing. So like 20 years ago, or if you think about like if you have a grandmother or you know a, a great uncle that's like lived in their home for 45 years, like they very much view that as a place where they have kids and they have memories Mm -hmm. and they're not thinking about like financial engineering of the home or like, Hey, how can I like use this home as a, as collateral to take money out, to go invest in something else. So I think one is just people are the way that they look at their home is changing one. Um, Two is 
given the housing market, people aren't buying their forever home anymore. So you have older millennials. I think I'm like a mid-aged millennial, technically. (laughs) People like me, millennials that are, you know, are want to buy a home, have the means to buy a home, but definitely are priced out from buying their dream home. So you have this other, this other really cool trend of like people that are entering the housing market are entering it at a different phase of life, often before kids with financial means, but acknowledging that it's not their forever home. So I think the, yeah. the end of those two things is like the average homeowner has a different relationship with their home than they used to is, is like theme one. I think two is prop tech and real estate tech is really hard. So like we're building yeah. a data business and it's just tough. Um, I, I put us, you know, in between FinTech and, and prop tech. And I say that because when Realm's producing insights in the same equation, we can be looking at someone's credit score as well as like the slope of their front lawn. And you're like, how are those two things possibly related? But they yeah. can be because it can you know, dictate what we tell them to build and how to finance it. Um, and a lot of the, tr- the traditional big FinTech apps, they just don't look at the, the prop tech data like that. It's messy, they're not used to it. So I think that's like another thing is it's tough. And data science has really you know, evolved quite a bit over the last five years. So the types of models that we use uh, to build our realm home valuation model, they didn't exist five years ago. Right. I think that's a key unlock. That didn't exist. For sure. Yeah. It didn't exist. So like you take like, okay, people look at their homes differently. It's a tough space, but data science is evolving and now is a lot more innovative and lets, lets you tackle that tough space in a, in a way that's actually doable. And you have this magical moment to say, okay, cool. How can we use data and data science and technology to really help people understand their home? Yeah. Yeah. And And what about on the consumer side? I mean, you know, you talk about the millennial demographic. Um, You know, I think of the way people, we have Robinhood go public today. Like so many people have been introduced to a much more liquid Mm -hmm. fintech environment, whether it's crypto or Robinhood or all the other things that they're using in their life. And, um, you know, when we were uh, interviewing for the TechCrunch article, I was I was telling the, the the writer, I said, you know, I the only thing that's really changed in my home is like my thermostats and my cameras. That's it. Like everything else is exactly the same way I managed it ten years ago. So there's just this huge opportunity ahead of us. Um, and I think people get very worried about like, well, what about all the competition and this? And that? I'm like, this industry is trillions of dollars. You know, you take not only real estate, but you take home improvement and all the other pieces of the puzzle. How do you guys, you know, you and I have talked about this. One of the things yeah. that is a challenge when you're building a company at this stage and you've only got 10 or 15 employees and you've just raised your first really sizable round of capital is focus. How do you think about focus? Um, how do you prioritize and what advice would you have for other entrepreneurs as you've kind of gone through that journey over the last six, 12 months? Because you guys are in a category it's so big, you could do a hundred, a hundred things, but you got to kind of narrow it down and pick a few. It's such a blessing and a curse. It's like yeah, the, yeah. the best problem to have. So yeah. I feel like I'm very lucky to be like, ah, oh, focus. We have too many people to make interesting things for. Um, right. Yeah. So I think we're, we're always in the process of trying to become more focused. So if you asked me that question a year ago, I would say we are building a tool that helps people understand homes. And I would have used the term people very broadly. And that could have been defined as a home professional, like a contractor or a lender, a home owner or a home buyer. So since then, we've already narrowed into like, we're really only working and focused on on homeowners right now. Mm -hmm. And specifically within that, we're really focused on new homeowners, people that have moved in in the last three years. And like for us, they're a great fit for really two main reasons. One is they just moved in, they just spent all this money and they're looking to make a plan. So they're like, hey, I want help. I need help. I haven't developed bad habits yet where I like trust my you know neighbor four doors down or like my uncle that has all the opinions. And then two is they're generally used to using technology and data elsewhere in their life, whether it's, hey, managing what I'm going to eat using like Noom or Fitbit, or I'm you know trading and executing a, a stock trade on Robinhood. So for us, that's that really sweet spot. And we're really focused on that group of which there's millions of people right now. Um, so that already has helped us say, okay, cool. Like I'm not, I'm not making a tool to help someone sell a house. Could we eventually, and can a lot of the data that we have be used for that purpose? Totally. But you have to say no. And we get inbounds all the time. Um, I get texts all the time from my friends that are like, Hey, like, let me see the back end of realm so I can buy a high potential house. And I'm like, sorry, no, <laughs> but it's, right, it's really right. but that's there. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's like around, and I think when you get one big thing we've had to do a a good job at is we get feedback constantly. People love talking about their home, which is awesome. But we have, you know, hundreds of customers a week telling us, I want this. I don't want this. This, this would help me out. And I think a big thing that we're okay at and need to get better at is like, how do we take that and organize that and make sure that we're building the right things at the right time? 
Yeah. And one of the things we had the conversation at the board meeting is don't take too much input from your board either. Because <laughs> we all, I mean, it, it, what I love about it is it's such a great application and space. I mean, I could give you a hundred ideas, but I got to hold back because you're going to be like, you're not building this for Jeff. I'm not the demographic. So if we left the board meeting saying like, Jeff has some really good product talks. <laughs> like, more involved. Put me on the product team. <laughs> um, what about, so is talk about, um, can we come back to the recruiting and team building thing? Because I, yeah. I think you've, you've done, like, I would argue that your team today is exceptional for where you guys are. And, and obviously I think you're, you know, you've got a, a bunch of folks that you want to hire from here. But what is the, um, what's the magic, you know, and, and a lot of times our LPs will ask me, hey, Jeff, you know, what's the difference between a, a company that kind of hits its stride and becomes great and one that just becomes good? And I always say it's the team. Like everybody has, you know, if you get to series B, C, D, E, you, you generally have product market fit. Yeah. It's just a question of, did you, were you able to go recruit the kind of people that could help you scale? And so how, how are you thinking about that? Or what are some of the key roles that you think you need to bring on to help you do that over the next, you know, six to 12 months? I take it really seriously. I mean, when I think about my job now, and I think a founder and a CEO job evolves a lot. If I thought about it from the seed to the series A, it was like do and, and build as much as possible. Like you're really a, a super powered IC individual contributor and you, and you start to recruit a little bit, but now it's transitioning to like, my, the number one thing I can do is recruit the best people. Mm -hmm. Because if we can't just do what we did from the C to the series A, that's not an interesting series B business or an interesting long-term business, right? So it's the single most important thing I'm focused on right now. I think, you know, to date, the way that we've been able to recruit really good people, I think one is we are solving an interesting problem and I never take that for granted. So like when you're, when you're talking to someone that's working at, has a great job at a big company, like, would it be harder if I was trying to convince them to sell like enterprise SaaS? Probably. Like I, I acknowledge that. <laughs> right. <laughs> like I, and I, right. I get that. So it's like, I think it's, it's one is like, they're solving a fun and interesting problem that everyone gets. If they don't own a home, their parents do, or they have a friend that does, or a coworker that does. So like people get it right away, which for sure helps. I think too is like, I've been very uh, transparent, maybe too transparent during the recruiting process about what I'm like and, and what I want for Realm and what my vision for Realm is. Um, so like every, this is a funny question a candidates increasingly ask is like, what's your plan to exit? And, and would you sell? And like, if someone offered to buy you in a year or two, would you take it? And my answer is absolutely not. And I'm like very clear in this. I'm like, we are building a publicly traded business here. So like, if you want to join Realm, you're signing up for a long time. I just want right. to make it clear. But I think that comes across and like, it gets people excited. So like my advice would be is be pretty open around where you see the business going, because for someone to leave their like cushy paycheck and cushy job, they have to believe in that and want to go on that ride with you. Yeah. And it's actually, it's funny. It's one of, you know, I wear my go long t-shirts all the time. Uh, it's one of the things, you know, feel free to use us because we wouldn't, yeah. we, we can't invest in companies that want to exit in two or three years. We, we want to back companies that want to, you know, entrepreneurs that want to build public companies. And I think that is a, that is an important journey. And most of the, most of the senior execs that I interview, you know, they don't want to go somewhere for a quick hit. They want to go somewhere for, to build something great. Uh, at least in today's market, particularly when IPOs are going out at 30, 40, 50 billion dollar market cap. I mean, 10 years ago, you'd see a, a billion or two billion and be like, oh, okay, that's interesting. But today the, the outcomes are so bigger. much bigger for IPOs. Yeah. The other thing too, I think is like getting really, ha having an open dialogue with recruits early on about like, what, what do you want out of, out of your next two to four years, whether that's Realm or someone else. And I think for, for us, like the, the majority of the people that are managers or executives here want to be founders and CEOs. So I know that like the value that I'm going to offer them, um, or they've at least mentioned that they're, that they're interested in it is like giving them exposure to people like you and conversations like this and topics and hard decisions. So I think, you know, getting to the root of like, what do you want out of the next couple of years? And then giving people exposure to those things, it goes a really long way. Oh, totally. I mean, think about the alumni network for Square and PayPal and Dropbox and Stripe. I mean, even today, Stripe is still a private company, but there are already tons of entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley that learned at Stripe and have now spent that. I love that. I love that vision because it's it's also something that people, I think, value that you know that that's where they want to go. And to some degree, they're investing in you and you're investing in them. It's a really cool symbiotic relationship. It's a two-way street for sure. So that's, and, you know, I, I think we're really lucky to have a team that shows that. Like our team takes a lot of ownership. They are all really good cross-functionally. They're all better at a lot of, they're all better at most things than I am, which is great. Um, 
That's awesome. And I think from a, a like future state, I think now we're at this position where we're really looking to bring on people that can make sure we set the right foundation, especially in key areas for the next phase. So something we've chatted about is like the importance of a people hire mm -hmm. really on, you know, we're less than 15 full-time employees, but we want to recruit a lot of people. And I don't want to bring those people into a system that's fragile. I want to bring them into a badass culture where they feel fully supported and like they know they know exactly what they're what they're going to get here. So that's a, yeah. a an example of a hire that we're going to bring in earlier um, rather than like waiting till the series B. Well, you know, I love that. <laughs> I think it's such an important hire. I think it's I think it's if you can get the right person early on, it's such a superpower. It's it's amazing in company building. And it's weird early on because you're by default the people person as the founder, which is like at odds. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I think it's OK. What about, um, so So obviously we didn't, we call it unscripted for a reason. So I'm going to ask you, quite, you know, how did you think about fundraising for your series A? Because you, uh, the, the the article points out, you know, you and I met about a year ago. And so, yeah. we, uh, and I knew what you were doing and we built a little bit of a relationship, but then, you know, you pinged me and said, hey, I'd love to give you the update and tell you the story. And I was like, boom, we want to lead you around because well, because we know this space. We love this space. And, and yeah. obviously I, I, I know you. And, and when you told me what you were doing, we were really excited about it. And, you know, when we find a great entrepreneur in a big market, we move quickly. But how did you think about it on your side? Because, you know, people, the, 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 the dark art of fundraising is a legendary conversation in the startup community. I just love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, I think one is you're always fundraising is the first thing I'll say. So like, as soon as we finished the seed round, my head was at, okay, what do I need to prove to raise a series A? Um, who would I want to raise a series? Who, who would I want to lead the series A? And like, what's the best way to run, you know, a pipeline to get there? Uh, and I'll take a step back and say, I come from a sales and marketing background. So I think of everything in life as a funnel. And I thought of the fundraise exactly that way, which I was like, okay, I have to have this many people that know who I am to have this many engaged conversations to lead to this many people that like would maybe write a term sheet to a partner meeting. So I was pretty thoughtful about that in advance. Um, I use the same spreadsheet I've used since the seed round to track all of that of like fund, partner, interest, likelihood of converting to a term sheet down the road. Um, for the, the A specifically, so we wrapped up the seed in the fall. I started talking to Series A investors, um, but in a very casual way, right out of the gate. It was like, I, I would talk to generally one or two a week and just say, hey, I'm going to tell you about what I'm working on. I just raised a seed. I'm definitely not fundraising. It might be in the next one to two years. And I'll let you know like when, when, when that's the case. Um, I did not stay in touch with a lot of those people beyond that. It was like, you know, they'd shoot a note and say, is it time yet? Is it time? Um, so by the time I, I felt ready to say like, hey, let's do this. I had a list of you know 20 to 25 people that knew what Realm was, knew what we were working on, and I, I would rank as like pretty high interest from mm -hmm. a sequencing of events. I wanted to work with the people I, you know, I was most excited about. So that's why you got the first ping, obviously. <laughs> I wanted to work with you guys. I'm glad I was on the list. I'm glad I made the list of 20. I was really thoughtful about <laughs> that. So the reason why I pinged you first was what you don't want to happen is the investor you want to work with is two right. weeks behind everyone else. Right. So for me, I was like, let me have the people that I'm most excited about. And this might, I think a lot of entrepreneurs do the opposite. They're like, let me shake off the dust with the, the funds I'm less excited about or the funds that are like, less well-known. I did the polar opposite. I was like, that's such a great point. You're right. I was like, let me have the ones that I'm really pumped about. The market's competitive. Let me talk to them first. We chatted. There were a couple of others. When you and I were talking, I had, you know, a calendar full of partner meetings for the next two weeks. And it definitely felt really good to cancel those. Um, but I <laughs> my advice be like, build a pipeline, be thoughtful. It's a long-term game, but I would order the funds you're most excited about first. Yeah, that's that is the opposite of what most folks do. You're right. And the advice, the general advice is go, go do your trial pitch with people you're not excited about. Um, that's interesting. And, and, and then um, any, any other advice you'd give to people? I mean, I think the, um, you know, a lot of people get wrapped around the axle around what kind of metrics do I have to show and this and that and you know, I always tell people like, it's all over the map. I mean, we do series yeah. A companies with no revenue. We do series A companies that have 5 million of revenue. And so the, the metrics aren't as important for us, at least as the founder, the market, the team, and kind of believing in the potential of where they want to go. But how did you think about that on your end? Yeah, I think that depending on the business, there's always different questions that people will ask. And I kept track of all the questions I got asked at the seed round because I was like, hey, you know, investors are still investors. Some of these questions, particularly the seed funds that also did Series A, will likely come up again. So I always had that on a like one of my tabs in Google, like and myself in these questions. Am I answering these questions? 
Um, and for us specifically, I knew the questions were going to be, uh, or generally the questions are like, is the market big enough? Which no one questioned. So I was like, I'm spending no time on Anybody that. who asks that doesn't understand like, what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, like zero time on that. So that's out the window. No one like, if, if yeah, exactly. Like if you're not a fit if you don't understand that. So then the next question would be like, is do people give a shit about this? Like, do they actually care? And then the last is, is it possible to build this? And I knew I could build this because I came from the real estate data space. So I spent most of my time on bucket two. And I would encourage people to say, like, identify the biggest questions that you're going to get asked by fielding them from other investors and then focus the ones that you know that you need to prove. Um, because mm-hmm. if the ones that you, like, you know you can figure out or like you can use data to, to, to prove that, like don't spend any time there. So for us, it was all around proving people wanted this, which directed a lot of our time to early MVPs, no tech MVPs, stuff using like Zapier and Airtable and making reports for people and getting feedback from thousands of homeowners so that way we could develop a lot of conviction there. Um, but I think it's around like prioritizing your efforts around the biggest questions. Yeah. And I think the last thing I'll say is answer investors' questions before they ask them. So when you are fundraising and having question and, and, and getting questions, immediately block time every night when you're out fundraising or having these questions to alter your deck, your pitch, your email that gets in front of the biggest question. So if you get hit with a question like two or three times in a row, like is the data quality good enough or can this be automated? That should be in the first three or four slides that you're mm-hmm, talking about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What about, um, do you have any feedback for investors? So you met a bunch of investors and I, I always think it's, I, I, I always ask our founders, what feedback do you have for us? How can we get yeah, better? Yeah. What, what feedback would you have for investors out there that you met along the way? Cause I think it's, it's always constructive. I, um, I had a really lovely, like t- this time, this time, I guess, cause it was so short, um, the, during the seat, I think I was surprised that investors say no to entrepreneurs all the time, but we had the privilege of saying no to quite a few investors during our seed round. And we got some crazy responses and, <laughs> and, and it surprised me. So I think I would just say like, Hey, entrepreneurs, you get told no all the time and, and, and you do it gracefully. And I think I, I would hope the investor community can, can show that as well. Crazy responses, meaning like people didn't deal with it well. Yeah. And I'm yeah. And, and as an entrepreneur, you're you are truly immune to it by the end. You're told no constantly. And like that's yeah. part of what I think the like, you know, how you can become a good entrepreneur. So I think that was surprising. So I think my advice would be is like, hey, like give con- give constructive feedback. Play the long game. Yeah. Yeah, play the long game. And a couple of funds did, and we still talk and it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely just because we invest across all stages. We are very, and if we don't do it, somebody should tell us, but we really try whether we meet somebody, the C, the A, the B, the C, the D every round, because we're always thinking like down the road, even in an IPO, we might want to be an investor. And so we want to build it. We want to build a strong relationship with that team. Play the long game. Awesome, Liz. Well, I, um, I couldn't be more excited. I, I'm, uh, it was fun to see the articles today and, and get to do this with you today because obviously everybody in our firm has known about the investment, but we now the whole world knows about it and we're, we couldn't be more excited for you and the team. And I just, this, this market is so big and you've got such a great vision for it. We couldn't be more excited. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. I can't wait to, to build a big business together. Awesome. All right. Have a great day. Great. Right, bye.